and we're open. So let's give it a moment. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a moment. Let some friends fill up the space. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Recording in progress. All right. Welcome. Welcome, friends. All right, we're going to jump in with some library news first. Um, I'm Anissa, by the way, I'm your librarian host. And if you've never been to an event with me, welcome. I provide a document that is a live and living document and has links to library news as well as links to our presenters and their organizations. And then anything that comes up, resources that come up along the way, I will try and keep up and add these to that document. So grab that link. It has everything you need, as well as the YouTube link to watch this later or share it later with folks. So we are here as part of our One City, One Book, and I'm excited to have Cap Brooks and James Burke of the Anti-Police Terror Project. And this is one of the first organizations I reached out to to be part of this campaign, and I'm so happy that they agreed. So first, let me tell you a few upcoming and news. This is part of our One City, One Book, where we encourage all of the Bay Area, San Francisco, to read the same book at the same time. And we're celebrating the amazing work of Ear Hustle and the book, Unflinching Stories of Everyday Prison Life, with Nigel Poor and Erlon Woods, who have been the most generous hosts and have done a lot of things for us over this campaign, including visit two of our local high schools as part of the campaign. We're able to give free books to many young scholars, so I love that part. Um, and they did two big events with us, so they have been work, and they also visited every 28 library locations and our bookmobile. They went on the library love tour. So they have been very busy with us and I appreciate all their work, but the best thing about this campaign is we get to bring in a many people that are in the same topic of the book and that have devoted their work and time and efforts to folks in reentry and community and keeping people safe and, and keeping the lifelines to our folks who are incarcerated open. Our library would like to acknowledge that we occupy the unceded and ancestral homeland of the Ramuto Shaloni peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland, and as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples. We wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramuto community. And I just threw in the chat box a link to one of my favorite all women led organizations coming out of the East Bay, Segorite Land Trust. Check them out. They do amazing work. And, you know, it's the giving, giving season. So give it up. A couple more events. We are rounding our, our I can see the end, tunnel at the end of the light of One City, One Book events. And it was big November through December events. I'll let that go by. Coming up this weekend, we have two big in-person events, the uh, legacy of the New College Law School be filming a documentary about uh, the work that they did at the new school. And then the amazing Sarah Cruzan will be in the, the library on Sunday, which is my favorite day at the library because you could also go to the farmer's market and go roller skating and do all kinds of things on Sunday at the Civic Center. But first come see Sarah Cruzan because she is powerful and empowering. Um, she spent over two decades inside for the murder of her abuser. And when she got out, I mean, she just learned so many tools and she, her book is so powerful. Books will also be available at the event. I encourage you all to come, come out and be present for this event. Some other last few events coming up are William James Association with Brothers in Penn, the writing and reading uh, group that meets at San Quentin. And then our final event with Dr. Jeannie Austin, San Francisco's own jail and reentry services librarian, one of them, and author. 
and they will be doing a panel based on inspiration, knowledge, and curiosity while incarcerated. Not one city, one book related events, but also noteworthy. And we just want folks to come out. We have in person again. I know it's iffy to still meet, but you can't beat an actual gathering around other people. So this is tomorrow night, The Mission, a documentary about the women behind the Latino task force and the community work they did during COVID and the pandemic and how it spread beyond just the mission, but their work really just valued, valuable to our city. Friday, or not Friday, next Wednesday, we have Nilofar Talibi and Kija Lucas, both amazing women, artists and author in discussion about what it means to be home. So please, we got lots of events coming up. I'm super excited about, and I'm going to now introduce our tonight's panel, panelist. So tonight we have Kat Brooks and James Burke of the Anti-Police Terror Project, which is based in Oakland. And they're gonna talk about the current moment in relation to public safety, the defund movement, and what is really needed in order to keep our communities safe. Kat Brooks is an award-winning actress and playwright and artivist. She's KPFA's co-host of Upfront, a resident playwright and actress at the Lower Bottom Playas in Oakland and Three Girls Theater in San Francisco. As an organizer, she played a central role in the struggle for justice for Oscar Grant and spent the last decade working with impacted communities and families to rapidly respond to police violence and radically transform the ways our communities are policed and incarcerated. She is the co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project and the executive director of the Justice Teams Network. Kat was also the runner-up in Oakland's 2018 mayoral election facing incumbent Libby Schaap. James Burke is a policy director for the Anti-Police Terror Project and the Justice Teams Network and the president of the National Lawyers Guild in the Bay Area. In 2007, he worked with the Southern Center for Human Rights, where he investigated human right conditions in Georgia and Alabama prisons, jails, and court systems. Burke left in 2009 to study civil rights law at Georgetown. After gra graduating, James moved to the Bay Area, thank goodness, where he worked with the Frisco 500 before joining the Anti-Police Terror Project's Black Leadership Committee and assuming role, the role of policy director. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over. Good evening, good evening. Uh, excited to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you so much to the San Francisco Public Library for having us. Uh, it was an immediate yes. Yay for librarians and libraries. Um, I have to get a new bio out there. So a couple things, because my producer, if he is watching, I will be in deep trouble. Um, I was the co-host of Upfront uh, for, no, 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 totally my fault. Uh, I was the co-host of Upfront and KPFA for uh, six and a half years. I now have my own show called Law and Disorder with Kat Brooks. Um, uh, Upfront ran from seven to nine now it's seven to eight and Lana's orders from eight to nine o'clock. And I second that, yay, thank goodness, James Birch moved to the Bay Area. Um, he's gonna take up the bulk of time tonight because he's the real G um, around this issue. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit, I wanna set some context and talk a little bit about APTP and actually, um, Thank you, Rachel. Um, and, and, and actually, it, it's, it's sort of serendipitous that this talk tonight um, is happening this week because I spent all day on Saturday with a woman named Brenda Grisham. Brenda Grisham's son, Christopher Lavelle Jones, who was a music, musical prodigy, um, was murdered on her doorstep on New Year's Eve 10 years ago. They were on their way to church. They were putting the babies in the car. They heard the bullets. They ran into the house. Christopher ran out to go get his baby sister who was in the car seat and was gunned down um, before he could make it back into the house. I actually didn't meet Brenda through my um, 
activism work, I met her as an artist. I met her through a project called Love Bomb. And that project was written, co-written by mothers who had lost their children to both police violence and street violence. In APTP, we say all violence is state violence. And I'll get to this more in a little bit because the state creates the conditions um, for all of the violence that we experience in our lives to actually occur. Anyway, Brenda, like so many mothers, so many families, has spent every waking moment of her life since the loss of her son fighting for, for peace on Oakland streets and for justice, and not just for her baby, but fighting to make sure that no other family ever has to go through that loss again. And I'm leading with that because we're in a particular moment in conversation, um, not just in Oakland, not just in Sacramento, um, not just in San Francisco, but across the country, where we have seen um, upticks in violent homicides, right? Um, and the response to that has been a few things. One, it's been to blame it on defund. Um, James will do a really good job of pointing out how defund really did not happen anywhere. I mean, the one case you could probably make is in Seattle. Um, but even then, it was like this much. Um, but they utilized um, this very traumatic, vulnerable, terrifying for a lot of us who actually live in the communities where this violence is happening, um, moment to vilify defund, right? Um, the second thing they, they did to the point uh, about those of us living in these communities, um, oh, I'm sorry, dear, you can um, share, this, share the first slide, um, uh, was that we, we didn't care about community violence, that if we were focused, if we were so busy working on issues around police and policing, then we must not actually care about the violence that are happening on these streets. Quite to the contrary, most of us live, as I mentioned, in the communities where this violence is taking place. Um, and secondarily, almost every single abolitionist I know, particularly abolitionists of color, we have been, we are survivors, not have been, we are survivors of various forms of violence. And we came to abolition because the carceral state failed to keep us safe in the first place. And then we found its response to be inadequate and sometimes um, an exacerbation of the trauma that we had experienced in the first place. So that's the context for which I, I, I come to you all this evening is having spent a day with families that lost their loved ones both to police violence and also to, to street violence. Um, and I'm gonna start with just a little bit about Anti-Police Terror Project. We are, James, we are going on 14 years old. Um, and we, we never celebrated our 10 year and like we <laughs> I thought about it, I was like we never we didn't have like a 10 year you know gala or whatever it is that 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 people do we've just really been busy doing the work but 13 years ago um, a, a group of black organizers and and some other folks some brown organizers and folks that had been in the streets around the struggle for justice for Oscar Grant um, came together um, because we had been in the streets responding to state violence right like they would kill us here, um, or they would kill us elsewhere in the country, we would take to the streets. And we had been about the business of doing that since um, Oscar's murder. And we stopped and we asked ourselves, what are we actually doing? Protest is important. Um, we would call that a reactionary form of organizing, a reactionary form of protest. And reactions matter, right? Protests matter. Interrupting business as usual actually matters because sometimes that's the only way you can force somebody to actually have the conversation, right? And people were not having the conversation around the genocide that was happening around Black life. I'll give an example. Here in Oakland in 2015, 11 Black men were murdered by the Oakland Police Department and Mayor Libby Schaff never once took a knee for them. In fact, she drove by the dead body of Demaria Hogg to do a town hall on policing without ever acknowledging that this father, who actually was the father of my daughter's best friend, um, was laying there and had been laying there dead uh, for hours. But we wanted to do more than just respond. And so we asked ourselves several questions. And I think, I think now, looking back, the most important question, well, the second most important question we asked, first most important question we asked was, what was happening to families in this process? The second most important question that we asked was, how do we stop state terror from happening in the first place, right? Why are we only responding um, when the state acted? And why weren't we talking about all of the ways in which state violence happened in our communities, right? When they kill us, that's the most extreme form of state violence, um, but everything from racial profiling <laughs> um, 
to unnecessary, unwarranted uh, in incarceration, um, to, and James will get to this, to the violent responses to community crisis as a means of keeping peace. Um, we're, we're, are also forms of state violence. And so we started to have conversations about what it would mean to, to stop it. And the data shows that the way that you stop state violence is you reduce the number of interactions that communities have with the state. And so that's what we got about the business of doing. We can go to the next slide. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge all of the lives lost both to the streets and the state. In the city of Oakland, we have surpassed 120 homicides this year and police in this country kill upwards of 1,200 people every single year. And there's actually, um, for those of you who listen to my show, you know tomorrow is the state terror roundup. There's a new article out in the Washington Post that I'm gonna talk about that shows that despite um, the increased resistance to police violence, despite claims that departments are reforming and things are getting better, the numbers of incidents are being vastly underreported and they're actually ticking consistently. This is our mission and it's a big mission, right? But this is the ultimate goal. May not see it in my lifetime, but we definitely want the world to look very different um, when we move on from this plane than it, than it was when we got here. We can go to the next. Uh, this is what we do our work. We work closely with families, right? Supporting them from the moment that they lose their loved ones for as long as they want. And that includes everything from organizing to communications, to going to the grocery store, to mental health support, to financial support, you name it, we are there. Um, most importantly, and what's something we're getting way more focused around is developing the skills and the leadership of these families so they can actually be in the forefront of the movement that they should be leading. Next. We work at policy at the local and state levels. Here you see two of our most recent victories. James may have more to say about the Crisis Act. I'm not going to spend our time um, there exactly, but the hope with that bill was to replicate um, work that we're doing with Mental Health First and Crisis Response um, and, and funding grassroots group to create alternative responses to community crisis. Our program, Mental Health First, we are the only non-911 response for mental health crisis support um, in Oakland, Sacramento, and, Sacramento, uh, and San Francisco. Um, and we just released our interpersonal intimate partner violence guide. Excuse me, y'all. It's been a really, really, really long day. Um, and so that'll be phase two, uh, non cost for response to IPV. Next. So there's this question about safety. And the reason why I started um, talking about community violence, right, and communal violence, and not necessarily police violence, because this is the, the drumbeat. This is what Fox News is talking about in order to terrify you and, and to justify the bazillion dollars that we spend on law enforcement that responds, by the way, after something has already happened. And this is actually the drumbeat inside of the communities of folks like myself, who every time my child walks out of the door, I hold my breath until she walks back inside. Um, I'm gonna digress just a minute and, and tell the story. My daughter's applying for colleges. I would be in big trouble if she heard me telling the story, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. My daughter's applying for colleges and she has to answer questions right in her essays. And, um, I can't remember what the question was, but her answer started something like this. When I was three years old, my mother bought a house on such and such street. I remember being sad because there were lots of kids outside, but I wasn't allowed to go and play with them. Because, and she puts quotes around these next two sentences, every year, hundreds of black girls go missing in Oakland. And the next quote was, stray bullets have no names. This caused me to listen in my sleep and thieve knives that I would shove into my pillowcases so I felt safe enough to dream. As sad as this made me, my mother's truths were reinforced when I had to wait for hours because there was a dead body in my driveway or when my best friend's father was gunned down by law enforcement. And then she goes on to talk about being resilient and black and amazing and queer and processing her trauma so that she can survive and, and, and live in her dreams. And I'm sharing this story because this is deeply personal. For so, so, no, I'm sorry, I'm not done with that slide yet. 
the story is, is, is so deeply personal for us. And, and, and when you see rage in us, it is not rage at individual police officers. So I got worse for uh, some of them. Um, it is rage because there is mountains of data, lived experience that informs, that should inform the pathways to safer societies. And does none of that data say that investing the vast majority of the funds that we have to keep our streets safe, going into policing makes that happen. In fact, there is very little data to demonstrate that more police means more safety. And it's not that the people that make these policies and pass these budgets don't know this. They know it. We've been screaming it. We email it to them. We tweet it at them. We Facebook book it to them. They know it. And yet the people that say that they are committed, invested, and dedicated to keeping us safe, ignore it in the name of protecting bloated budgets and the status quo. So who is it then you tell me that does not care about the preservation of life? Who is it you tell me that actually has little to no interest in actually keeping communities safe? The way we do policing in this country results in this. And this actually drives up so-called crime. Because the most important sentence on this slide is, if people are locked out, <coughs> excuse me, of the above ground economy, they will make their way in the underground economy. They will feed themselves, they will house themselves, they will clothe themselves by any means necessary, as would you or I, if we did not have the privilege of being positions of sitting in the seats we are sitting in this evening. Next slide, please. We've been focusing a lot on trauma. And the reason why this matters is because you have to think about where trauma sits in the cycle of violence. And this is the simplest way that I can say it, right? And this isn't my, these aren't my words, you've heard this before. Healthy, happy, whole people don't hurt people. Fed people, clothed people, housed people, people with health care, people with mental health supports, people with trauma supports, people with therapists, people with quality education, people with living these jobs. The vast majority of those folks, right? They can't do all of anything. They're not out there hurting people. Traumatized, wounded, desperate people hurt people. So why would we not invest resources in addressing root causes and stopping harm from happening, happening in the first place? Next slide, please. And it doesn't give us safety. That's what we all want, all of us, every single one of us. I don't care if you're a conservative or a liberal or a progressive or an anarchist, we all want safety. And so the conversation should be centered not on protecting the status quo, not on maintaining myths of what gets us there, but data-driven decision-making that actually creates this for all of us. Next. And this is just the basic facts. And I feel like I say this over and over and over again, but I'm gonna keep screaming it at the top of my lungs until people understand that we incarcerate more people than any other planet on the, any other country on the globe and more than several countries combined. So again, data-driven and uh, decision-making and logic would dictate that more jails, more prisons, more police are not gonna get us the outcomes that we want and deserve. Next slide, please. I've already said this, but I, I'll let you sit with this for just a second. And the way I talk about this is like, right, so like when I was door knocking in Libby's neighborhood, I couldn't find the police in broad daylight with a flashlight. And yet they have, right, some of the lowest numbers of crime uh, in, in the hills of anywhere else in the city. I live in the flats. At any given moment, on any given day, I can spit in any given direction and I'm going to hit a cop car. Hopefully not literally, because that's actually a crime, but you get my point. But yet we have the highest numbers of so-called crime in the city. Next slide, please. So this is the work that we have set about to do, to redefine and reimagine public safety, to actually create solutions, to move beyond the reactionary, beyond the protest, beyond the screaming, not stopping doing those things, because for some folks, that's all they can hear. Right? Like folks were talking about police 
terror. And so some of us started shutting things down like freeways and BART trains. You were mad about it, but you were having a conversation. Our work is about getting to the root cause, investing in prevention and developing people powered models because we, those of us closest to the pain are the ones that are the experts at the solution. Next slide, please. One of the primary ways we do this is developing alternative models of response to community crisis. Next slide, please. They talk a lot about folks like me being divisive. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our work is about building unity and power and healing in our communities. They uh, one of the tactics that the state tried, and then I'm gonna turn this over to you, James, to get ready to to actually put some data and history and, and organizing plans to, to this, um, was that they were literally in the media, right? Pitting families, not just folks like me and James against families, but families against families. Families that have lost their loved ones, the police don't care about us. Families that have lost their loved ones to the streets don't care about us. And they were doing this intentionally because they knew and they know that when we are unified, when we are able to identify who the actual um, enemy, that's a, yeah, who the actual enemy is, when we have an actual target that we can develop a plan around, when we can identify the same shared material conditions that have created the strife inside of our communities, our families, and our lives, that that's when we're going to build the power to change um, the conditions and improve the quality of life for all of us. And so they work actively to, to separate us. They work actively to divide us. And we have uh, responded back resoundingly with a no. James Birch. Take yourself off mute. Right on. Thanks so much, Kat. And can you tell me, can you see this, Kat? I can indeed. Right on. Um, so I'm going to, as Kat said, try to provide some context uh, around APTP's overall mission. I know a lot of folks have heard a lot of things about defunding the police and the concepts behind defund, but just as Kat said, uh, there's no one who cares more about our communities than we do. And so when we talk about defunding, really to us, uh, it represents a, a data-driven exercise uh, in an attempt to find out what really works for public safety, uh, and then a uh, public education exercise where we try to bring that information to the community in an accessible way, which is what we're doing here. And so I'm going to take a little bit of time uh, uh, and give you all kind of like a, a municipal budget 101, where we talk about city budgets. Uh, with a focus on Oakland and explain what we mean by the need to defund the police and explain what we mean uh, when we say there's a need to invest in our communities or reimagine public safety. Okay, so uh, uh, this is a look at the 2020-2021 uh, Oakland city budget, right? And what's important for folks to see uh, in Oakland's general fund is the massive amount of money that goes to law enforcement, right? As you can see here, the police get as much money uh, as almost uh, all of the rest of our major programs combined, right? You can see libraries in there as well, uh, parks and rec, housing, transportation. And so uh, folks often have a misconception, right, that, uh, um, uh, that we are um, kind of paying for all services equally and, and, and investing in our city in a healthy way. And as Kat said, that city council members uh, are taking an irrational approach to the budget, right? And what we've been trying to explain for the past uh, a decade or, or more is that that's really not what's happening, right? What has happened over uh, 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 the last several decades in particular, uh, but really uh, 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 over you know much more time than that, is police budgets have exploded, uh, taking up more and more of the city budget, uh, while the programs that actually keep us safe and that data demonstrates uh, um, 
um, uh, improve public safety numbers, uh, those budgets have decreased, right? So we're going to start with the police and then we're going to move into what actually keeps us safe, right? So uh, again, as I just mentioned, um, this, this uh, theory that we can uh, police away our problems, right? That if there are people who are struggling uh, and need resources, we don't need to give them the resources. We actually need to uh, uh, arrest and incarcerate them for, for uh, committing acts of desperation as something that's really exploded over the last several decades, right? Starting with the 94 crime bill, right? Uh, um, uh, uh, under President Clinton, with now President Biden uh, 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 in uh, Congress, uh, the 94 crime bill incentivized cities across the country to spend millions of dollars on policing uh, uh, with the reward of receiving millions of dollars in federal grant money to augment their policing budgets, right? Um, so what we saw across the country was cities, a lot of uh, majority black cities, um, rush to put as much money in policing as possible to get in the, 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 the crime bill money in the theory that if they had huge policing budgets, then that would lead to safety, right? What we've seen since then that this is uh, absolutely incorrect uh, and the data uh, uh, um, shows uh, clearly that these, these, these theories were incorrect, um, but, but that's where the federal dollars were. Right. And so if you were a city and you were trying to get money for public safety, really the biggest available pot was for policing. Right. And you had a federal government that was desperate to get uh, hundreds more police in every city to stop these super predators, which were the, the, the which was the language at the time. Uh, uh, and as a result, um, a bunch of cities took the bait, invested, went all in on policing uh, uh, and let the budgets for other city programs languish, right? Here we see some examples from Atlanta, Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee. You can look all over the country, right? Uh, it's, the, it's the same story in largely every city, right? And again, we'll, uh, uh, we'll bounce back here to Oakland, right? So you can see like a little more uh, uh, a granular look at where the money gets spent, but again, Right, all of the programs on the right side of this budget, libraries, housing, transportation, human services, these budgets are not serving the city of Oakland. Right? These budgets are not adequate, right? All of these budgets need to be dramatically increased. Race and equity is not even a million dollars, right? All, you know, uh, all of these budgets need to be dramatically increased, right? But that's impossible, right? It's impossible to invest in any of the budgets on the right side of this equation right, uh, or sorry, on the right side of this uh, uh, chart, um, because police spending is so high and continues to increase year over year, right? And the reason that that happens, uh, as, as Kat mentioned, is not because of the data behind policing, right? It's because of the strength of the police lobby, right? And the, in the knowledge by city government officials, city officials, that if they go against the police, they'll lose their seat. Right, we are. I mean, we're talking in San Francisco here, where we saw what happened with the Chase of Boudin recall. I could have done a whole presentation on some of the policies, all of the some of the data-driven policies that Chase was trying to bring to San Francisco um, um, that uh, were essentially rejected uh, uh, by voters uh, in favor of more draconian law and order policies that the data does not support. Right, so you could do your whole. I mean, you know, we could do this whole analysis on what works and what doesn't work within the criminal justice system. Right, but it also applies uh, to budgets, both here uh, and in San Francisco. Um, okay, and so and so, what are police doing with that money? Right, wow, three hundred and thirty million dollars in, in Oakland. You know, there's also a theory that police are spending money efficiently, and and everything happens like we see in the movies where they're out chasing, you know, bad guys as they call them, uh, or as the as the propaganda that we see all over our television screens uh, uh, would suggest. Right. But unfortunately, like not only is that not true, that you know they're 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 also uh, uh, some of the highest paid city employees uh, in any given city, right? Uh, and it's not as if these pay scales were made by design. There's a lot of uh, collective bargaining 
where the police use their uh, positional power and the, uh, as I mentioned, the unwillingness of, of, of city politicians to get in their way to uh, uh, make sure that their contracts allow for the type of exploitation that allows you to make uh, $265,000 in overtime on a $202,000 budget or $202,000 based out, right? This slide here doesn't also doesn't include other pay, which is a whole nother category um, um, uh, uh, that you know that, that officers can dip into as well. Um, but I just wanted to people to get an idea of the type of money that we're talking about, right? And so, so, so what are these officers doing, right? Uh, what are these officers doing uh, across the country with all of this money? Are they responding to you know? Are they chasing down violent crime as they would violent crime as they call it? Uh, um, uh, no, they're not, right? They spend the majority of their time, uh, uh, they spend at least half, uh, and in some cities, the majority of their time responding to non-criminal calls, right? Uh, and often spend, you know, four, five, six, you know, under 10% of their time responding to calls for what we define as violent crime, right? So, you know, we can look at Oakland's uh, calls for service uh, in 2019, Right, and again, we see 4.2% for what is defined as violent crime and 6.9% for what is defined as property crime. Uh, and then the whole rest, you know, 90, you know, 80 plus percent, 85 plus percent is for other things, right? And so one of the major uh, 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 assertions at the center of this defund conversation is if police are spending 50% of their time responding to non-criminal calls, why are we sending police at all, right? Could we be sending other responders, right? Mental health first responders, like uh, uh, as Kat said, we've been working on our mental health first program in, in, in the city in Oakland has uh, the macro program under the fire department, right? Or um, um, instead of having uh, police respond to for traffic enforcement, which the data show does not improve civilian uh, 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 does not lower pedestrian deaths, why not invest that money into environmental design, making our streets and curbs safer so people uh, aren't uh, uh, um, to, to improve public safety, right? Uh, and so again, um, if you look across this wheel, uh, you'll see that when we have a lot of conversations with law enforcement, it's always about violent crime, this violent crime, that we didn't have the staff, we didn't have the resources, we didn't have, it's not true, right? The, the, what's true is that they get paid for all of these calls that they're going out for on this wheel, right? And they need to maintain the massive budgets and salaries that they have. And so if they were only to do, to respond to 10% of the calls in this pie chart, they'd be losing 90% of their patrol income, right? And that's not good for the police officer association. And so they're gonna fight against it, whether or not it's rational, whether or not the data supports it, whether or not they actually need to be responding to these calls, because they don't. Okay, I'm uh, gonna do it on time. I'm gonna speed up, I'm gonna speed up. Uh, uh, no, no I'm, no, I'm right where I want it to be. Okay, great. So, so that's, that's enough, that's enough on the cops. That's enough on the cops for now. Right. You know, I could we could talk for a long time and go into in each area how they take money. And, and I think I have one more slide that's going to go into that a little bit. But I think what's most important for the rest of our, our time here, because we want to leave time for questions, is that um, folks understand that just like we have the data on the police not doing what they say they do, we have data on the things that would actually work. Right. The programs that we have to be investing. in, Right. If we want to improve public safety. Right, and we yell about them till we're blue in the face. And as Kat said, what's clear, what's clear to us is that city officials, they all know about this by now, right? They know about it in San Francisco, they know about it in Oakland, they know about it in Berkeley, they know about it in all of these cities. They know the truth of this matter, right? They just are unwilling to stand up to the police lobby, right? Which is why they don't shift the investments from the non-criminal calls that police are responding to, right? to these programs that actually work. And so I don't have too much time, so I'm not gonna belabor the point on these, but we're just gonna gloss through some areas, right? Like uh, uh, something as simple as housing, right? 
uh, uh, investing in low income housing, investing in supportive housing for people with, who are diagnosed with what we call severe mental illnesses are both documented to improve public safety, right? Conversely, uh, uh, there's a, a relation between foreclosure rates and violent crime rates, right? That has been established several times, right? So you house people, data seems like it's pretty good, right? You kick people out of their homes, I suggest that that's pretty bad for public safety. Again, uh, um, this is all pretty common sense when you think about it, but uh, uh, it's important for folks like us who look like us and who advocate in the arenas we advocate in to have the data that demonstrates this uh, uh, in a concrete manner. So again, uh, you shift money from housing to housing from corrections. Uh, and again, there's a the, 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 the violent crime rates uh, um, go down. Um, Here's some data on improving access to healthcare and to, uh, um, sorry, I should say substance use treatment centers. Um, um, and then there's some data on uh, relevant to the city of Oakland, the correlation between uh, air lead levels uh, and property and violent crime rates. And so one way you can improve public safety is by uh, doing lead mitigation across the city. Um, uh, Okay, uh, youth programming. Um, again, some of these are obvious, so I'm not gonna belabor them. One I do wanna find though, for the purposes of this conversation, um, um, Parks and Rec, because that's an area where, where Oakland is, is, is really um, behind where we could be, right? Uh, improving our public spaces, cleaning up parks, making parks accessible, uh, um, um, improving and creating public gardens, not only makes our city look better, it improves public safety, right? Uh, uh, there are studies on violent assault rates going down, right? There are studies on uh, on violent rates of, of, of what they define as violent crime in general going down. Uh, and these programs have been popping up across this, the country in response to this data. And it seems like each one is a success story, right? And I'm not saying that you can do these things in a vacuum and all of a sudden all of our public safety problems will be solved but these are part of a, a larger tapestry that is the solution, is investing in our people, investing in our spaces, investing in families, investing in, 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 in all sorts of families, traditional, non-traditional, uh, uh, and, and making sure that everyone has what they need to thrive. And so the, the, what I wanna end on here is here's an example from the city of Oakland that's important for folks to understand how if we are not watching, uh, money will flow straight from uh, what we fought for into the hands of law enforcement, right? So the people of Oakland voted overwhelmingly for Measure Q, right? I put the text of Measure Q up on the screen. It's very straightforward. Uh, $21 million that's supposed to go to, as they define it, homelessness, support services and programs, trash removal, and accessible park restaurants, right? So big win for the city, super exciting. This money is gonna, you know, and it's not gonna do the whole thing, but it's gonna, you know, allow us to invest further in the things that we need to improve you know, the, the status for the thousands of unhoused people who live in the city of Oakland. And then what did we find out that our mayor was trying to do with those funds? Uh, we found out that the mayor was, uh, 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 through our city administrator, um, planning to spend a million of those dollars on what they called uh, uh, the, the OPD homeless outreach unit, which were really uh, 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 police, a police unit that what they do is they enforce eviction. And so if a group, if a street is being swept and all of the unhoused people who live on that street are being forcibly evicted, right? Then the police sit there and use the threat of force to make sure that the eviction goes, right? That is not what people were paying for or what voted on, right? And that's what not, not what the money is supposed to pay for, right? But when you have administrations and the machinery of city government that moves so quickly, this is just a line item hidden in the budget. Right. And if you don't have people continuously watching and ensuring that the implementation matches the will of the people, even well intentioned uh, uh, attempts to uh, reinvest in our people will be co opted uh, and will be turned into more money for law. Um, so that's uh, uh, again, here's here, this is the last slide I, I, on, on, on investing uh, in efforts to interrupt violence. Right, which is something that, that that we need to be that we have some programs on in the city of Oakland need to be spending more money on. Um, these programs work, right? Programs like Advanced Peace work. There's data from 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 across the state 
uh, and they really need to be given a chance to thrive in the cities like Oakland and San Francisco. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, right now, they're often attached to programs like Ceasefire uh, that pay for in the city of Oakland, uh, not only uh, violence prevention programming, but you get, you know, $8 million in violence prevention programming, or sorry, sorry, you get like uh, $800,000 in violence prevention programming uh, and $8 million for policing. And that's the ceasefire package, right? And so um, again, uh, a lot of well-intentioned uh, uh, efforts um, are, are, are watered down by administrations like the Schaaf administration that are not down with uh, reimagining public safety. Okay, that's a lot. Um, um, uh, but I think, no, I'll just I'll just wrap there. That's a lot. I I I, I want to I want to make sure that folks understand that what we've given today or what I've just explained is just a drop. Try to give you an example of the types of things that reimagining stands for, and I want you to understand that they apply across uh, all imaginable areas of uh, our, our our life in the city, right? Whether it be uh, pedestrian access or, uh, uh, or traffic or mental health or, or serving our unhoused communities or interpersonal violence or, or serving undocumented folks, like all of these things, we have a choice, whether we're going to go a route that uh, uh, relies on criminalization or whether we're gonna go on a route that truly invests in trying to, to get at the root causes of the problem. How'd I do, Kat? Like I said, you're the G, uh, and I don't know if uh, you, well, I do know, because I know you. Um, <clears throat> James really is the godfather of the defund movement in this country. Uh, Oakland has the longest running defund uh, campaign in the nation, formed in 2016 here, um, following bloody 2015. Um, which was then followed in 2016 with the revel revelation, excuse me, by Celeste Squat that she had been raped and trafficked by 14 law enforcement agencies across the Bay Area, including OPD. And we were um, scaling, well, I was watching people scale, the flag post outside of the Oakland Police Department uh, in protest and smoking a cigarette and uh, said, what the bleep are we paying them for? Flicked my cigarette, James walked away and came back, I don't know, week, two weeks later with answers about exactly what we were paying them for. Um, and there you have it, you all, the birth of trying to do something new and different with our dollars. Uh, I don't know. Are we facilitating the Q and A? I are think you... I think we're just letting that all sink in for a second. But... Oh, okay, fair <laughs> enough. Fair <laughs> enough. I have to do that at the end of every day too. <laughs> um, there are a couple questions in the Q and A function, and then the chat is also. And YouTube viewers, I'm happy to bring back any questions as well. But there's one that says, since um, and this I can help that document that I put in will help answer this question since incarceration probably results in less safe communities. Are there effective programs for reintegration of returning citizens? And you know, I, I, you flipped through a slide about your reentry program, but there is many. And I, I'll put the doc link in, but if you want to, one of you want to take that. I mean, I'm always and forever going to shout out Dorsey Nunn. Um, and all of us are none. Um, and the work that that they do reintegrating folks back into our community and and what's what for me is is most critical about their work um, is the skills development of folks that are coming home uh, from what I call American concentration camps so that they could be at the forefront of their movement. But also um, one of the, the guiding principles of APTP's work and in, in partnership with our sister organization Community Ready Corps is self determination an agency of black and brown people and black and brown communities, meaning how do we house ourselves, educate ourselves, employ ourselves, heal ourselves. Um, and, and if you look at the work of all of us or none, it has really been rooted in building agency, right? For this population, this population that society throws away and then just continues to throw away and throw away and throw away until there's nothing left to throw away anymore. So all of us are none. 
uh, is, is a group we work in deep solidarity with and folks should know about. Um, another question from our Q&A is, um, I appreciate the APTP, APTP's approach to change through policy. Um, it's just so mind boggling how folks don't see this example, Chase of Boudin, the breed tenderloin state of emergency move, um, the massive overtime for police. How do we get folks, voters and supervisors to like get this through their head? You can start, James. Uh, for sure. I'll I'll say that um, we've been doing this in Oakland for, as Kat said, we've been around for well over a decade now, and we've been organizing in the city and building power in the city of Oakland for well over a decade now. And so um, um, I want to make clear that uh, the city officials are, are keenly aware uh, of all the factors that at play uh, and, and the conversations that we're having now and the information that we're providing. They have all of that, as, we, as we've said uh, uh, several times, I think it's really important for everyone to walk away with that, right? And what these folks are uh, determining is, you know, uh, if they do X or Y or Z, uh, uh, what is it, how does it affect their chances of getting reelected? Right, and that is uh, one of the, if not the only driving factor for the vast majority of the politicians I've had the experience working with, you know, almost regardless of where they find themselves on the political spectrum, almost regardless of what their motivation is um, for, for entering the political arena, right? They want to maintain, you know, if they wanna to continue to be in the political arena and uh, then, then, then they're gonna need votes, right? And so, uh, as APTP, we know this, right? And so if we're trying to reimagine public safety and get some of these initiatives passed, we understand how many votes need to be uh, gained at the city council level, right? And, and, and in San Francisco, um, the amount of money in the game is higher, right? The, the, the political entities are uh, uh, more better resourced. Um, and I don't see... Um, an organizing outfit that is well resourced enough to fight the fights that are needed right now. Mm -hmm. How was that? <laughs> it, it, it was awesome. Um, I, you, you know me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chime in a little bit because the politic is just as important as the practice, right? Um, and so what I mean by that is when we first formed, we actually didn't mess around with, with, with policy. We actually were adamantly against messing around with policy. And that was because our analysis was Policy is about fixing things, right? Um, and policing in this country, the carceral state in this country is not is not broken. So you cannot fix it and it can never be fixed. It, it cannot be reformed. Its job from birth out of the Calvaries and chattel slavery was to protect uh, race-based capitalism and the, the machines, black and brown bodies um, uh, that were the engineers of, of race-based capitalism. Um, by any means necessary, which often was, you know, hunting, um, incarcerating, and killing. That practice still continues today, right? Um, but for us, and, and again, in partnership with our sister uh, organization, Community Ready Corps, we started having conversations about how dire the conditions for our people were, right? And so some of the fights that we have actually with the left, <laughs> uh, that we really try not to, to fight with our own folks, right, is that folks live in ideology as opposed to reality, right? We wanna live in this ideological place. You should never do this. You should always do that. You shouldn't think this, you shouldn't want that. But folks are actually living in the conditions that we're fighting. And so the conditions were dire, dire enough that we knew that it had to be all roads in. Um, and that included policy, but radical reform, not just reform. And, and by that, I mean, we don't support reforms that um, reinforce the status quo. So you will never see APTP championing body cameras. You will never see APTP championing cultural competency trainings. I don't know how many more millions of dollars we're gonna waste on that trash, um, probably many more. Um, but you will see us championing things like dirt decertifying police officers. You will see us fighting for um, change in the use of force policy in the state of California um, for the first time in 150 years. 
The other piece about the politic is we are never going to get free at the ballot box or in, in, a, in a legislative session ever. The system is always going to protect itself. We do not and will never have the means to, to, to take down one of the most, not the most militarized country on the planet, right? Um, so it is just a tool. It is, is a piece of a much, much larger strategy. That includes, as I talked about earlier, um, self-determination and agency, building that up in our communities. Because, and that's why our, our theory around small replicable models, people have to see it to be able to know that it is there is another way. And once people understand that there is another way that actually gets them the outcomes that they're seeking, they're gonna fight like hell for us to be doing it that way instead. Tipping point theory, I guess we could call it. Thank you. You went back on mute, Anissa. After three years, you think I get this. Um, I say the same thing every meeting. I'm like, yo. <laughs> what can be done if you're not currently politically active, but are looking for effective ways to help defund the police and shift funds towards social policy and services? That's from a YouTube viewer. I mean, my question is, do you want to be politically active? <laughs> so if you're not currently active, politically active, and you don't want to be politically active, you can um, donate. <laughs> um, you can signal boost. Um, you can push back, right? When you hear the rhetoric, I don't know what is happening in y'all city. Uh, I, I mean, I just, I, it's, it. There are pieces of it that are just terrifying to me. Um, and I'm, just, you know, I mean, y'all know what you get when you ask Hepworks to come places. I don't mince my words. The fact that Brooke Jenkins is sitting in that seat where Tessa Boudin sat just a few short months ago, it did, my whole head explodes. The fact that San Francisco is going to um, re-attempt the war on drugs, which failed across the country miserably, um, it, it explodes my head, right? Like, and, and some of this work is done in coffee shops and over hopefully your masked your masked uh, holiday dinners um, over the next two weeks um, on social media, et cetera. Um, but I also encourage you to figure out, get in where you fit in, right? Not everybody has to go get tear gassed or arrested. Um, not, we need uh, people to cook food, to watch children. We need communications folks with, you know, there's all sorts of things that movement needs. Find what makes your heart sing and do that, get engaged. And, and, and be data driven. The same thing that I was screaming about, about the politicians that are making these decisions, you be data driven so that you can hold them to account. Don't just have opinions, have facts because they're out there for you to have. That's right. Um, one thing I would add is that uh, this police money finds, it way, <clears throat> finds its way everywhere. And so, you know, almost regardless of, of where you work, um, it's likely that there's a law enforcement agency or private security agency that your uh, entity is in relationship with. And if that's the case, just explore that uh, mm -hmm. and be fully aware of what that looks like and what folks are doing in your name or in the name of your organization or not doing. Um, and then uh, another thing is, is, is defund is a public education campaign as its heart uh, as, as, as much as anything else. And a lot of the conversation uh, and the reason why we populate spaces like this one is that um, the police have an incredible propaganda machine, right? And they've convinced everyone that they, you know, are out there, you know, diving around corners, saving the day, <laughs> <laughs> right? We're serious, right? And we, and, we, and, we, and we just know that's not true. And like I said, we know, you know, the, 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 the sad fact is that most cops make their uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year sitting in their car, you know, idling on Lake Merritt, scrolling their phone, right? And so that's a racket. And those are the dollars that are critical, right, to all of the endeavors that they tell us that we don't have enough money for. I'm sorry, we don't have enough money for the rec center. I'm sorry, we don't have enough money for the, for the youth violence interrupter program at your high school. I'm sorry, we don't have enough money for the new mental health clinic. Right. It's 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 it's, you know, when these cops are pulling millions of dollars, getting overtime sitting by Lake Merritt or outside of an Oakland Roots soccer game 
or, or, or something else ridiculous. And so um, just having the conversations and just absorbing information like this and making sure you share it out um, is critical if we're going to move the marketplace of ideas. Like when you look across the country at the backlash to defund, it didn't hit in Oakland like it hit in other cities. And the reason why is as Kat said, we've been having these critical conversations for a lot longer than many cities in the country. And so a lot of folks really know that the police are, or get a lot of money uh, in illegitimate ways. So defund isn't just a four letter word in Oakland. Defund is kind of a, 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 a theory of budgeting that folks need to understand. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. Can I tell a story? Can I tell the story? Um, and this actually gets at uh, two, two of the questions that, that I saw in the chat. So I'll do my best to segue smoothly with my tired brain. But folks will remember that during the George Floyd rebellions, and excuse me, y'all, I know that my mouth, my, my speech is impaired. Um, I have something going on with my mouth and it's been very hard to talk all day, self-conscious about it. But um, during the George Floyd rebellions, Libby Schaff attempted uh, to impose her second curfew when I say attempted because um, you may remember she tried it in 2015 and we shut that one down. Um, and then here comes 2020 and um, she tried to impose another curfew and APTP called for an F your curfew march, right? Because it wasn't about safety uh, from COVID. It wasn't about taking precautions so people didn't get sick because if that was the case, then the city and not community ready core <laughs> um, would have been providing the PPE, the information, the supplies, et cetera, that people needed in order to stay safe. It was about silencing the scent, right? So she tried it and we called for an F your curfew march. And there was this, and 8,000 people showed up, y'all. <laughs> Um, and we had uh, PPE and, and we did you know our best and we did our best to socially distance and we were outside. But I remember standing on the truck um, and all of a sudden, 8,000 people started chanting defund OPD. And I just went, because we'd been beating the drum, right? For five, six years at that point. Um, and that I want that goes to the question about impact. So yeah, we're based in Oakland and Sacramento, but we do work across the country. We train organizations, we support families, we train municipalities. Um, it, to our point about small replicable models, we don't uh, insist that people replicate APTP chapters. Um, we just share our values, our principles, and our structures, and provide the support and the training people need in order to do that. Um, we have spoken to the United Nations. We have spoken to the World Health Organization. Um, our folks were just in Italy um, at a conference. And then in terms of impact, um, Oakland, I, I won't say just ABT because we didn't, we didn't build this movement by ourselves. Oakland is why we are having the conversations about reimagining public safety. Oakland coined the term, excuse me, James Birch as my policy uh, director for my mayoral coined the term reimagine public safety. Um, we've always used communications as a strategy, not just a tactic. So we've been talking to reporters forever, folks um, uh, and trying to shape the public narrative and building relationships with reporters and holding them accountable for the way that they talked about this issue um, and done that at the local, state, federal, national and international um, levels from jump. Uh, when Oscar Grant uh, was murdered and the resistance happened or the rebellions happened, it was also the time of Arab Spring. And folks, some folks who were in movement at that time may remember young people in Egypt with signs that said, I am Oscar Grant, right? So this has always been a global conversation. We are students of movement, and that is a tradition of the Panther Party, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, excuse me, um, that we do our best to continue. And to, I believe her name was Emily or Amelia's question, you get involved uh, with APTP any which way you want to. We meet once a month virtually, and we're not gathering people indoors just yet. Um, we do do work in San Francisco. We need we need ground soldiers, uh, warriors in San Francisco. And so if you're about that business and want to get down, hit us up, aptpinfo at gmail.com. Because Brooke going to keep us busy, y'all. Real busy. Let's see. There is a couple more questions. We will try to keep on time, not keep you over, over too long. But... Um... 
So are there any similar groups like this in San Francisco? I, I'm happy to hear you are also infiltrating San Francisco too. Yes. Oh, we've been, we, we've been there. Those, those 2015 protests, when we, when we said goodbye to Chief Sir, <laughs> uh, we were, we were, we were on the ground then James, um, you know, and, and I both uh, worked in solidarity with the, the, the Frisco five um, and continue to work in San Francisco. Um, we also tried to, you know, we don't live in San Francisco. And so um, we do our best to support efforts that are happening in the city and or if folks ask for support and or trainings um, to provide those to the city. Uh, but sometimes we just got to jump in feet first because it gets that hot over there, like with killer robots. Woo. They reversed they reverse that vote. Oh, I know they um, did. <laughs> I'm clear. <laughs> um it's interesting you know i i'm always thinking like if we if a librarian tried to put in for overtime there is no such thing no such damn thing i'm like wow if they give overtime to librarians and teachers and library staff where would we imagine be? the world we would live in can you imagine i, I mean i can i can and I think that's what's important, just what you said. I mean, you know, maybe we should end on this is that, yes, we can imagine a world like this. And, um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I've done this two months of, of programming with people who are really in it. Like, and, you know, I, I ask often, like, how do you maintain your self-care and your, you know, and it's just the devotion and the reimagining that you can see this happening. Yeah. So, folks, this is your last chance. We're going to let our, our our two panelists go for the evening. And last questions. There's lots of love from our YouTube crowd as well. Thank you, YouTube crowd. I do want to say I I, I want to end on this note. Unless people do have questions, somebody um in the in the chat um responded to something I said. Or it might have been something James said, but with the word radical. And um, people use that word as an attempt to insult <laughs> us, those are radicals. Um, but two things around that, right? First of all, radicals is not, a, is not a four letter word. And I don't think that's how the person utilized it, right? If radical means that um, I believe that everybody should be housed, clothed, fed, have health care, have a living wage job, get a quality education, not be unarmed and gunned down um, by law enforcement, whose motto is to protect and serve, then I am as radical as they am effing come. Um, and the second thing is the radical is actually rational. It's what's rational. We're not talking about extreme viewpoints here. We're talking about a way to have a more functional, equitable, thriving, healthy, and safe society for everybody. Even the folks, right? Even the folks who fight us tooth and nail. We are fighting for you too. I hope you're listening. We are fighting for you too. It's rational. James, final words. Oh man, Kat, Kat just said it. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, take this opportunity to express appreciation for Kat. Uh, uh, man, you, you know how it is, Kat. Uh, um, when I came into uh, this work, I had a lot of enthusiasm uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and, and, and not so much analysis. And so uh, I'm just grateful to Kat for what she's created here in the Bay Area um, that can be a, a home for people like me to learn how to fight for our people, because uh, that's what we're doing. And so shout out to Kat and an invitation to anyone listening, if you want to fight for our people, uh, that's what we're doing. I, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Anissa, no, we're, no. we're never gonna, we're, we're never gonna leave. Um, then I have to pay that for it. And he, he's not here and he is very rarely um, visible, um, but he is just as responsible um, for the growth of this movement the, uh, in, in the Bay Area and beyond. He is um, one of the greatest movement scholars and strategists of our time. His name is Terha Ak, and he is the co-founder of Anti-Police Terror Project. He is what I call reverently my basu, which means teacher, and he is the founder of um, Community Ready Corps. So if you if you want to get more schooled in deeper politic, um, <laughs> please follow 
and support Community Ready Corps. Oh, I mean, and I will say like they have nine arenas and one, the, the relief arena is what they would call policy, right? Like how do we lessen the weight of the white supremacist boot that sits on all of our necks, not just black necks, all of our necks, right? Policy is a way where we free up a little bit of that pressure so we can wiggle around a little more freely in our fight for liberation. Terha Akio. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I put in the chat the doc that has all these amazing resources and then some. And I'm going to throw it in there one more time. There it comes. It's a little slow tonight. All right. James and Kat, thank you so much. The Anti Police Chair Project, we appreciate you being here. Library community, thank you as always for being engaged and taking part in our One City, One Book. And invitation is always open. Let me know. Thank Shout you. out to Annie, my brain, and James's partner. <laughs> the organization. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody. Night. Good night. Good night.